Chapter One of Our Little Australian Cousin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Little Australian Cousin by Mary F. Nixon Rowley. Chapter One Land. Fergus and Jean were very tired of the long voyage. They stood at the taffrail, looking over the dancing waves, longing for the sight of land. "'It seems as if we would never get there, father,' said Fergus. "'How long it is since we left home!' "'And how far away Scotland seems,' sighed his mother, as she took little Jean on her lap and stroked her fair hair. "'But Australia is to be our home now,' said Mr. Hume cheerfully. "'See, there is the very first glimpse of it.' And he pointed across the water to a dim line as the lookout called, Land! We are passing Port Phillip's Head, he said presently. See the lighthouse. Soon we shall land and you will see a beautiful city. Beautiful, Fergus said in surprise. Why, I thought Melbourne was a wild sort of place. You have told us about the time you were here long ago, before you married my mother, and you had floods in the streets and had to climb up on the top of someone's porch for fear of being drowned. "'That was fifteen years ago, my son,' said Mr. Hume with a smile. "'Melbourne is very different now from what it was then, "'and then it was not at all like what it was when the first settlers saw it. "'It was in 1836 that Robert Russell came here to survey the shore near Port Phillip "'and find out where the boats could go up the river Yana. "'He felt this to be just a place for a city, planned Melbourne, and laid out the streets. "'It seems strange to think that then the blacks owned all this land,' and the Wawurong, Bonorong, and Waturong tribes roamed these shores, and that when Russell laid out his city, there were native huts standing. The place was called Bear Grass, and in 1837 there were thirteen buildings, eight of which were turf huts. Now Melbourne is seven miles square, and the principal street is a mile long. You will soon see how handsome the buildings are, for we are now making ready to land after our long journey. Fergus and Jean Hume had come from Scotland to live in Australia. Their father had been a farmer, but he had lost all his little fortune through the rascality of a friend, and had determined to try again in the colony. Australia is a colony of Great Britain, just as Canada is, and though it is at the other side of the world, it is still British. Mrs. Hume had a sister in Sydney, and they were to visit her before going to the Gold Country, where Mr. Hume intended to try his fortune. Fergus was a fine boy of twelve, and Jean was eight, and both were much excited at the trip, while Mrs. Hume's sadness at leaving her old home was mixed with joy at the idea of seeing again the sister from whom she had been separated for years. The landing on the Melbourne Quay proved interesting for the children, and they were very much impressed with their first glimpse of the city. "'Why, father!' exclaimed Fergus, as they drove in a cab up Flinders Street. Melbourne streets seem as busy as those of Glasgow. Indeed they are, my son, said his father, smiling. Perhaps they're busier. You see, Victoria is the busiest part of this country, although the people of New South Wales will tell you that their district is far superior, and Sydney a much handsomer city than Melbourne. If the wares one sees in the streets are any sign, Victoria must have a great variety of products, said Mrs. Hume. The shops have all manner of things in the windows, and besides there are great drays of wood, coal, and timber. Victoria is called the Garden of Australia, said Mr. Hume. You will see considerable of it if we go up to Sydney by rail instead of by sea. Oh, father, cried Fergus, who loved the water. Are we going to do that? I haven't decided yet which would be the better plan, Mr. Hume answered. I had thought of going by steamer and stopping at Hobart in Tasmania, but it will take a great deal longer and you will miss the trip round Victoria, which is said to be the prettiest part of this great continent. I think the sooner we reach Aunt Mildred, the better for all of us, said Mrs. Hume. The children are tired of the long voyage and winter will soon be here. Winter! exclaimed Jean. Winter! Why, mother! cried Fergus. It's June! Yes, I know that, said his mother, but don't you know that in the southern hemisphere winter and summer change places? In Victoria, midwinter comes in July. Will it be cold? asked Jean. No, dear, winter here is not like our nipping scotch frost. 
It is not very cold here, and it rains in winter instead of snowing. I don't think that is nice at all, said Fergus. We'll have no sleighing. There are many things we will miss here, said his mother sadly, but his father said cheerfully, There are many things here we can't have at home also. When I get to the gold fields, you shall have all the gold you want, and that is something you never had in Scotland. Now, our fine drive is over, and here we are at the hotel, where we shall have some luncheon. How have you enjoyed your first drive in an Australian city? Very much, cried both the children. It will be some time before you take another one, for I believe, after all, that we shall go by boat to Sydney. I understand that the sea trip is very pleasant, and it is less expensive. I'm glad, said Fergus. A boat sails this afternoon, and there is nothing for us to do but have our luggage transferred from one boat to the other, said Mr. Hume, as they all went in to luncheon. End of chapter 1